please welcome to the table Richard Marks. I have to say, you shouldn't refer to Norman as that gray haired guy in the second one. <laughs> <Yeah, well, laughs> he is used to it, but at least you got a full head of hair, which is, uh, which is a nice thing to, uh, you know, you need a haircut just like I do. So, uh, anyway, thank you, uh, uh, Richard, for appearing here. Uh, again, I, I want to, uh, we met a couple of weeks ago at that uh, restaurant in, in Santa Monica and had this wonderful conversation. And, uh, of course, I forget everything that I asked, and I forget everything that we talked about. But all I remember is what, what a really, really nice guy. But what I do remember is, show everybody this. That'll I start. asked him, I asked him that night, without noticing that, are you a mouse guy or a <laughs> keyboard guy? And this was surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome. He was a mouse guy. So, folks... Learn your keyboard shortcuts, because this is the result of years and years of moving the mouse. Right, Richard? I'm going to be the poster boy for that. Exactly. So you should tell everybody, learn your keyboard shortcuts. Um, let's, let's start at the beginning, because that's normally what we do in these sorts of, of, of interviews. Uh, what I learned about you was that you, uh, uh, you were an English literature major. You had no interest in the film industry when you were going to college. And like a lot of editors and a lot of filmmakers, you sort of fell into this. Could you give us a story of, of how you got into this business? Uh, and kind of get sorry. close to the microphone? Uh, really very serendipitously. Um, I think like a lot of people my age, my generation, uh, Film was not something that was normally studied. You'd, there were very few. <coughs> excuse me. There were very few uh, active film schools in the country, <coughs> and uh, frankly, I had no idea uh, about the film industry other than I like to go see movies. Um, I left college with a degree in English literature, and found that I had, of course, not prepared myself for any way to make a living. Um, which was sort of part and parcel of the 60s, I think. Um, yeah, having a, an English literature degree is kind of like having a sociology degree. You yes. kind of go to college, yeah. to either your parents wanted you to go, and you yes, really don't know exactly. what the hell you want to do. Exactly. Right. And um, I was sitting around one night with a friend, and we were discussing what we were going to do with our lives uh, post-college. And uh, both of us were rather confused and uh, <laughs> uh, indecisive about it. And my friend uh, said to me, well, why don't you go get into the movies? And I said, <laughs> yeah, OK, well, what am I going to do? What do you mean get into the movies? And they suggested, well, uh, I have a brother. He works for a commercial company and uh, uh, for an advertising agency, excuse me. And, uh, I don't know, maybe he gets you a job in an editing room. I said, what do they do in editing rooms? Anyway, to make a long story and a boring story shorter than it actually took to get into an editing room, um, having nothing else I really wanted to do, I decided to try and get into an editing room. Why? I mean, why editing? Well, it was either that or going back to graduate school, which I found <laughs> a terrible idea. Um, and I really had no plans. I hated the job that I had. And I decided, well, let's give it a shot. I don't know anything about it. Was there that one sort of magic moment where uh, editing meant something to you and I want to get into this? Uh, a year or two later. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, mostly it was grunt work. It was uh, running. You were a messenger for a while, right? I was. Which had that, nothing to do with editing. For that man over there. For this man here, by yes. the way. Uh, uh, we'll talk about this man a little bit later in the in the show because I just I just met him and it's a fascinating story. It's but go my ahead. brother in law, by the way. Right. Um, but that's what I did at first, and I think the inertia of not knowing what I wanted to do and with my life um, 
led me into this job, and as I learned about editing, I began to grow very interested in it. And interested in, in a strange way, interested in it because it seemed to fit my personality so well. Uh, it was uh, detailed anal work that I really enjoyed. I, I enjoyed the focus of it, the concentration, and I loved the concept of the manipulation that one could do as an editor. So when you were a teenager, you were anal, you were detail-oriented, you were, were goal-oriented? Well, I was goal-oriented, and I'm afraid I've just become more anal with age. <laughs> but... <laughs> Really? <laughs> really? Really? I do, you know, as I get older, I just, just want to retire and quit. <laughs> just go away. <laughs> Live no, with the I elephant found, seals in Cambria. I, I, found, I found it was a very good mix for me. It was something I really enjoyed and something I could really put my heart into. And it, it involved storytelling and drama. Still at the beginning of your career, you find you're working in commercials, you're working in industrials. Um, let's skip to getting into feature films. Uh, and how on earth did you go from commercials and advertising and industrials into feature films? Well, a lot of it, I think. Was and you were still in New York, right? Yes, I okay. was in New York. And New York was had an industry, a film industry, that was uh, a lot more fluid than it was in Hollywood. Yeah. And it allowed you to move, I think, more quickly, uh, not only upward, but laterally, going from something like commercials and industrials to feature films or documentaries. Um, uh, there was a great deal of fluidity uh, in your movements in New York. Yeah, speaking of that fluidity, let's 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 list a couple of those. Uh, you know, for those of film aficionados out there who uh, who uh, who love the '70s and this and the uh, late '60s films, um, New York was producing some of the greatest films ever at that time. I don't really understand why yet. There's books been written about it. Uh, uh, but they did not seem to have the uh, Hollywood corporate uh, mentality. Uh, but then neither did Hollywood uh, at that time. So I don't know no, why New York. That's not true. I, I think you, Hollywood really? very much had a corporate mentality. Had a even, in the, even in the 70s? Uh, because we did, we did, you know, Easy Rider in Hollywood. Uh, yeah, but that was an, almost an independent film. Uh, Easy Rider was not a studio film. The studio still existed. They still controlled what you do, how long you worked in a given field, uh, and they still made it very difficult for independent people to make films. I think what came out of the 60s uh, was independent producers who didn't really give a damn about the studios. And they raised the money independently, and they financed the films, and then they sold it back to the studios and figured they could make a buck off of it. Well, they were producing a heck of a lot of good films in, uh, in, well, New, in New York. Well, they were because New York never had that studio structure. Uh, if anything, it was anathema to New York to work in that way. Uh, actually, growing up in the film industry in New York, I, I could have sworn that I'd never wind up here. Really? In, in Los Angeles, truthfully. Was there a snobbery, though? At, uh, uh, there was a rivalry. There was a rivalry. Uh, as a film editor, uh, even though we belonged to the same union, or the same international union, um, we, as New Yorkers, were not allowed to work in Hollywood. Uh, and what, 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 what? <laughs> no, we were not allowed Seriously? to work here. If we came here on a film, and if they made it possible for us to work, which often they prevented us from working, they would insist that the studio or the producers put on a standby editor wow. to basically sit there and earn a salary while, you know, while we did the work. And in retaliation, New York would do the same. So it became impossible to make the move. As a matter of fact, when I finally moved out to California, I had to apply to the California local to join. And uh, thankfully, I had just been nominated for an Academy Award. <laughs> and I remember meeting with a business agent, and we had coffee, and it was very pleasant. And I said, Look, I'm moving to Los Angeles. 
Uh, I, I'm ready to make the move. I've spent three years working in San Francisco. I'm ready to move now. Um, I will not be working out of New York. Let me into the union. I said, well, I don't know. This is going to be a problem. Let me work on it. Let me talk to the board. And he spoke to the board and got back to me and said, well, they're willing to let you in. Oh, I, I forgot one thing. Let me, <laughs> uh, let me just say that at the end of the conversation, I said, look, I'll do it any way you want me to do it. I said, but no is not an acceptable answer. And if you <laughs> don't let me in, I'm going to spend every dime I have suing you, and I'm going to make it very public. Seriously? Yes. Wow. And uh, I said that. I said it good-naturedly. I didn't say it threateningly, but I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> you said it good-naturedly? Yes, I said it good-naturedly. Well, the truth was, he came back to me and said, well, I've spoken to the board of the local out here, and we will allow you to go into the union as an apprentice. And I said, you got to be kidding. I said, look how bad this is going to look in the trades. Academy Award Award nominee going back back as an apprentice. apprentice Because you won't let him work. So they came back a second time and they said, okay, we'll let you into the union, but you cannot work. There was a a Los Angeles roster, which I think still exists now. Uh, And the roster was very stringent then. It was run by the studios mostly. And the unions agreed to the, all the terms of it. And it worked in the unions' favor because it saved their jobs and wouldn't allow outsiders to come in and do the work of their union members. Um, and he said, we'll let you work out here and work, uh, cut a feature film. But you cannot work for any of the studios with which we have an existing contract. You can only work on an independent movie if they haven't yet signed an IA contract. Wow. And so help me, someone was looking after me because I got lucky. Was the eight-year really rule still in effect yes. at that time? Oh, yes, it was. And did you have to go through that eight-year rule no, even no, when you no, started no. to work in that? Eight? No, but they put me, Barbara, what was the category? Do you guys know the eight-year rule back in the old days? <laughs> back in the old days? The eight-year where the assistant editor would have to work for eight years before he would be eligible to uh-huh. edit a movie? And that was primarily to, I think it was, the editors just were protecting their jobs, right? I mean, that was primarily the reason. Well, I think basically that was the reason. Um, But they did have three grades of editors. You could go in Three grades. Grade one, two, or three, depending on on the roster, depending on the uh, number of years you had in. And Norman, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, So they let me in as a grade one the lowest possible grade. This was in this New York was, or San no, Francisco? this was here. Los Angeles, okay. I, as I said, I got very lucky and uh, I was offered a film to cut made by an independent studio that didn't have an existing contract with the unions out here. And they hadn't yet signed the contract and the deal was if I went like a good little boy and yeah. went into it, they would in fact let me into the union and I'd be uh, uh, sort of grandfathered into the union through the contract that they signed. I don't quite think you were a good little boy. Well, I got into the union. They gave me a card. That was the last time I visited the union. Okay. And uh, (laughs) uh, so that was 81, I think. And... um, 81, you were, my God, you were were so well established by 81. You had done some absolutely wonderful movies. You did The Rain People with uh, Francis Coppola. You did Alice's Restaurant with Arthur Penn. You did Little Big Man. You did, uh, oh my gosh, you you know, on and on by the time of 81? Well, they were calling the ground rules. All right. And uh, if I wanted to work here, that's what I had to do to work here. Do you have an ego at all? <laughs> well, I think, yeah. I, <laughs> there, were those, there are those who would say I have too big an ego. I know, that's a, yeah. that's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure uh, yeah. you do. I think I, think I do. Um, but I wanted to move here, and at least I was not getting a no. I was getting a yes. It was a conditional yes. But it was a yes. Uh, since then, that whole system no longer exists. 
although it is still difficult to get into the unions. It's not exactly open. I think your life changed, at least in feature films, with uh, when you worked for uh, Dee Dee Allen. Well, I, uh, this is one, another one of the very lucky points in my life. Uh, I was at the right place at the right time uh, with the right credentials. She needed an assistant. I was there. I got the job. Yeah, you, one, of the, one of your quotes that I've seen on the internet in an interview you did with uh, Rick Young, you did an interview with him. Um, your life seems to be a lot of luck and a little bit of talent, although I think it's a very oh, humble it. sort of thing. But, it, but a lot not, of editors always say a lot of luck but and a not, little bit of talent. It, it's not humility. It really isn't humility. I think there is a certain amount of luck. I know some oh, wonderful sure. editors who are just not in the right place at the right time. And opportunity passes them, and it just happens. But you seem I to have was. made your opportunities with Dee Dee Allen, yeah. who was well-established, who was kind of a superstar but, but in, I, in I New, was, New York. I was lucky that she had reached the end of the film. I had gone back to working as a sound apprentice to work on her crew. And yeah, let's back up a little bit and, and tell, tell everybody how you met her. By the way, Dee Dee Allen has been at this desk uh, a number of years ago, which we're very, very privileged to, to have. And, uh, uh, and she mentioned Richard Marks. And, uh, of course, Richard Marks was, was part of this, this, this team of, of people that... that they were called Dee Dee's Boys. Yeah, Dee Dee's Boys. And, of course, Richard Marks was the valedictorian of Dee Dee's Boys. And uh, she, uh, she thinks very highly of you, and, and bless her heart, and, uh, and uh, um, I, I miss her. Uh, so, uh, but going back to that, you, you still made it kind of a mission to talk to her, even though when she was well, a super... I was, I was working on her sound crew, um, Alan Heim, who's... Alan Heim, many yep. of you probably know, um, was the supervising sound editor uh, on the film. And I stepped backwards to take a job as a sound apprentice so I could make the move into features or get as close to them as I thought I could possibly get by being a sound apprentice. Uh, at the end of that film, uh, the woman who was Dee Dee's assistant and uh, the young man who was her apprentice, both decided not to continue on with her. So all of a sudden, miraculously, there was this opening. Uh, I asked for the job, and I lobbied very hard for it. I pressed everyone I knew to call her. And uh, she finally checked me out and said she would give it a shot. And then, behold, the union said no. <laughs> of course. The New York union said no. You haven't been an apprentice long enough. Um, and uh, <laughs> luckily, once again luck, the movie um, Alice's Restaurant was postponed. It was postponed for about three months, which miraculously took me to my two-year minimum apprenticeship within uh. the union. So I was able to call up the business agent and tell him where to stuff it. <laughs> what did you learn from Dee Dee Allen? Oh, I learned an awful lot. Uh, I learned I learned a lot about editing. I learned a lot about <clears throat> really w w dealing with the directors. You know, in a real world situation, she's so busy editing. How does she find the time to actually spend well, any time with her assistant editors? That was the great thing about it. It was the great thing about editing then on film was that the first assistant was generally in with the editor and standing behind them all the time, handing them pieces of film. And you learned by watching, you learned by asking when it was appropriate to ask, and with someone like Dee Dee, you really learn because Dee Dee loves to talk. <laughs> and she loved to explain things. She was a natural teacher, and she, she was great. She was great to be in the cutting room with. So that's how you learn. And uh, besides that, she also would say, would you like to cut a scene? No, not me. No, I couldn't. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, and when she would, you, you would cut a scene, she would give you the footage, we'd screen it together, we'd make notes, and I would go off and neurotically stand at the movieola for 
days on end trying to finesse this piece, then I would show it to her and she was always great. She was always great because she was never really critical. She would say, did you ever think of trying it this way? Or did you ever think of trying it that way? It was always a positive approach where you felt that you were part of the process, not that your work was being tossed out. And it was a great learning experience. Was your background maybe in, in English literature helpful in, in your taste in, in the way you shaped scenes? Perhaps. I, I, can't, you don't know. I can't be the judge of that. I think, I think it does. I think, it, I think studying literature and drama eventually helps you in dramatic films uh, have a, a different sense of judgment about things. But I, I really can't answer that. The, you know, the difficult thing about talking to editors is, is that we don't Excuse exactly me. know exactly what you do in the editing room. We don't know if you're the one responsible for this particular cut, or the director was, or the studio and I'm was, not or the tell producer. You either. That's, that's the wonderful thing. We talk about great editors. Great editors uh, are, are usually determined by great movies. Yes. Uh, the, by the material that you, that you work on. Yes. And uh, is, is Richard Marx really a great editor? You'll Probably. Never, well, never, no, no, know. no. Yeah, I know. Never know I know. You, don't, <clears throat> you know, it's the thing that we had discussed. You but never, you've you never worked on so the, many damn good movies, you must be. It's like it, the odds say that you are. But, it, you know, if you went to a person, if you went to Norman and said, Norman, uh, I'm thinking of hiring this person. Uh, are they a great editor? Well, I mean, I, I would assume that Norman would say, gee, I don't know the material they had to work with. If I knew the material, I could make a better judgment. But you're looking at a finished film. You don't know who made the decision. You don't know you could sit there and say, oh, I wish they had gone to a close-up right there. That's where they should have gone to a close-up. But perhaps they had no close-up. Perhaps they had no coverage for that scene. So how do you judge an editor's work uh, you know, in such an offhanded way? I don't know how you do it. But why do all these, let me, let me just, let me go through this, this list. Because this is fun. No, it isn't. No, it is fun. Why do all these extraordinary directors keep hiring you? Francis Coppola, Arthur Penn, Charles Shire, James L. Brooks, Herbert Ross, Oliver Stone, Elia Kazan, Jan Kadar, Sidley Lamet, John Hancock, Nancy Myers, Penny Marshall, Ro uh, Richard Donner, uh, Nora Ephron. Uh, not only do they hire him once, they hire him that. again. So you must be doing something right and giving them something that they need. Okay, I, I don't think we can beg this question anymore. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so uh, I win. <laughs> you are good at what you do, you know, and what is it that you, makes you so good at what you do? You could look at this another way, and you could look at that list and say, what do these people have in common? And a lot of them are dead. What's <laughs> that? <laughs> But some of them are still alive, and some of them probably would hire you in a heartbeat. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you know we we talk about the 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 craft of editing, and and we we talk about a Richard Marks who who uh, is is one of the greatest editors ever. But you still have to you still have to get that. You, you would think that you can pick and choose whatever gig that you want, and it's not like that, is it? I mean, you still have to pay the rent, and you have to support the family, and you have to. Well, I and think. It's, I why think it's, do you did you ever get to that point where you can pick and choose your scripts? Yeah, I think I have. Uh, it, it always weighs against. Gee, can I afford to stay out of work for six months right. and wait for something I really want, or do I have to pay the mortgage? Um, I, I I think there's a certain amount of reality and truth in that, uh, <clears throat> especially with freelance people. You work sometimes because it's there and you need to work. Uh, you do get to a point where you may be offered many different scripts and you can pick and choose and say, no, this is what I want to do. This is the uh, <clears throat> subject I'm interested in or the people that I'm interested in working with. But 
I mean, sometimes it does happen. You know, it's a, it, <laughs> I love this. Because if you go to IMDB and you actually look at the, uh, the list of... Uh, they ask if I'm the singer. <laughs> yeah, Richard, <laughs> Richard Marks, the singer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what you're not. But he did all these great movies. Last Tycoon, uh, Lies My Father Told Me, Godfather Part Two. Tough guy, Serpico, bang the drum slowly. He did from 1973 to 1976, he did those films. And then what did he do? Kojak. <laughs> Speaking of paying the rent, yes, you damn well right. And, no, it's, it's just, you know, it's only been in probably the last 10 years or so that we, we, we actually, that editors have become somewhat of a celebrity. It's, it's, well, before think, then, you guys were really invisible. Uh, I think that's true, and I think there was always more of a stigma in Hollywood about crossing between feature films and television than there ever was in New York. Uh, New York, a television series, was bread and butter to an entire industry, and uh, that wasn't the case in California. It was very... Um, uh, it was very divided here. You either worked in television or you worked in feature, and in some ways it really still is. I, I think perhaps in the last few, last five or ten years, there's more crossover, but still not a lot. Um, we're getting close to... Uh, you, do you want to show that scene from uh, Apocalypse? No. All right, so we can continue. Can, <laughs> you know, we, we can actually talk about Apocalypse now for 45 minutes before we actually go to the break, but uh, you worked on a lot of movies that had a lot of drama behind the scenes. <laughs> I mean, The Godfather 2, Apocalypse Now had more drama in that. How, how long were you originally contracted for that movie? I think it was supposed to go out there for six months. And you were, uh, you, you were there for how long? Three years. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I've always had trouble telling time. <laughs> you, you were there for, th for three years, and of course uh, we all know that there's a lot of mythology surrounding uh, uh, Apocalypse Now. Most of it's true. And, yeah, okay. You were the supervising producer, which begs no, the question, editor. or supervising editor, excuse me, I'm sorry. Supervising editor, which begs the question, what the hell is a supervising editor? Uh, someone who takes on just not only the responsibilities of cutting, but for running the cutting room. And, uh, so you so make sure that, that everybody's, everybody's on the same page kind yes. of thing, right? Yes. And Basically. you were there for three friggin' years to make sure that everybody was on the same page. Not that it was counting, but it was two years, 10 months. Two, all right, yeah, <laughs> two years, 10 months. And um, did you, for all, for all of you who, who know about Apocalypse Now, it was fraught with, with an enormous amount of drama, not only delay after delay after delay, uh, uh, and, and cast changes, and uh, um, typhoons uh, destroying the sets, and, uh, and uh, unusable dialogue that came back to you. Were you there from day one of production, staying in San Francisco and getting the material? It was 230 hours total at the end of this whole thing. It was more film than it's ever been shot, for, for goodness sakes. And how did you manage all that stuff? Uh, with difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was not there from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, there were two other editors who started that job before me. Uh, one was Barry Malkin. Um, uh, no, Jerry and I started at the same time. Um, <clears throat> and Evan Lotman uh, was one of the editors who worked on it for a good long time, at least through the typhoon. Uh, and um, I came on along with Jerry Greenberg uh, in, God, what was it? January 77, I think. Which was how far into the production? Well, they had already, uh, the sets had already been destroyed by a typhoon. I think it was probably about six months into the production. Uh, they were in the Philippines. <clears throat> and it was like a 16 a months production, right? It was supposed to well, be a six week. it was very week. long. Uh, as yeah. I said, the, uh, uh, first of all, the lead actor was at first replaced. So they had to do reshoots uh, to redo his part. Uh, then... The major set, the Kurtz compound, uh, the character played by Marlon Brando, 
uh, that set was uh, destroyed in a typhoon. And uh, they had to wait for a few months till they got the money and uh, the weather uh, to rebuild. And um, they did. They rebuilt and they started shooting again and finally finished the film. Uh, however, they finished the film with some things missing. <laughs> yeah. uh, the script was cut. The narrative, uh, the na narrator's role, the narrative that held, that was the glue for the entire movie was never shot. And the decision was made to come back to the States, <clears throat> see what we had, and uh, deal with that problem later. Did, when you're on a picture that long with that kind of problems, with those sorts of delays and, and all the issues going on with, uh, over in the Philippines, I said, did, did you ever just want to quit? Yeah, many times. Uh, I mean, I think it, it's does same. that reflect on your personality as this goal-oriented guy? That I'm just never going to quit. I'm just, I just don't do that. Well, I find it very difficult, the thought of quitting a film. I think I've only done it once in my life. Um, uh, I do feel compelled to finish things. Um, I don't, I, I, I guess it's part of my stubbornness, yes. It serves me well, so I can't complain about it. Well, you, you, just, you don't quit. You just don't quit. I don't like to, no. As I said, I've only left one film where I finally said I was being driven crazy, <clears throat> and it was time. It was time to leave. The final product of Apocalypse Now, are you happy with it, or do you...? Uh... It's, it's really hard for me to say. I think it was an incredibly ambitious movie. Um, I think it has some brilliant work in it. I think it has flaws in it that we never <clears throat> completely solved. Um, it, it has its problems, yes. but it is a benchmark movie, uh, certainly culturally in, in our time, as you know, one of the first films to deal with Vietnam. Uh, I think Deer, uh, Deer Hunter was the first. Uh, that came out, but Apocalypse was surely the second that dealt with it, at least the way we dealt with it, questioning it. Um, uh, I think there were a couple of Green Beret movies that uh, preceded that. But yeah, I think Apocalypse is a monumental work, and uh, it will stand as a monumental work. Every film you work in, every director that you work with, um, are, uh, is completely different, but a lot of the films that Richard Marx has worked on has been fraught with a lot of drama in the in the, in the background. <laughs> I mean, I, really. I've been accused of being the source of it. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, it's, it, it really. We were talking about you know Godfather Two. We got uh, you know the terms of endearment with some uh, couple of actors who didn't like each other and the low budget problems and things like that. And then you know, we can we can point out a lot of other movies too. But uh, Richard Marx worked on a lot of movies that had drama problems in the background. Did you? You're aware of these problems, but does it affect you as an editor? Uh, sometimes the, you know, if it's a particularly uh, uh, adversarial situation, of course it affects you as the editor. Um, but generally, you close your doors. The great thing about the cutting room is you close the door, it's dark, and you work on the material. Uh, and hopefully you keep out as much of the politics as you possibly can. Um, that's the nice thing about it, not working in production. One of the, uh, you know, I read you the list of some of the uh, directors that you have worked with over the years, and you've worked with some of the finest directors ever. Um, what kind of director do you like as an editor? What, mm -hmm. if for those of, out there who are directors and who want to communicate with their editors, can you give them any advice on how to communicate, or do you ever even listen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I do listen and I take what the director says very seriously. Um, I like to screen dailies with the director, get their notes. It isn't necessarily what I will follow in putting together my first cut, um, but I like to know what the intent is 
behind the way something is shot or the way a performance is built. Um, I think that's very important for the editor to do. I think as a director, you should let the editor do their first cut uh, if you have enough strength to do that. Uh, it's hard because you've given up your baby to someone else and you're asking them to interpret something that you have a fixed idea of in your head. And I think it takes a very strong and a very smart director to take that kind of input. Now, speaking of that first cut, do you always, uh, depending on the director, and I'm assuming it's, it's, it's every director you work with, do you allow that, do you make sure that this scene plays before you show the director, or you just assemble it for, no, no, on the, I, where the script says to assemble it? No, I, I, I play with the scene. I make it work for me as best I can. I mean, do you yeah, put right. temp music in there? You put special effects and sound in no, there? No, I don't put special effects <laughs> in. I do, I do use sound effects at times. I do a lot of dialogue work when I, I'm doing a cut. Um, I certainly put in sound effects, music occasionally, um, not often, because I think it, in some ways, for a first cut, it colors it in the wrong way. <clears throat> Forgive me. Um, I think it's dangerous to do too much work and make it look like too finished a product. Really? Yeah, I really, I really think you do. And I think it's one of the difficulties of electronic editing because it looks so smooth now yeah. when you show, when you show uh, a first cut of something. It looks so polished by nature. When we were cutting on film, uh, you, you, know, you had shoe marks and uh, cigarette ashes all over it, and it sort of looked worn. Um, but there's a danger into there's a danger in finessing it too much. As the editor, I think you have to make the scene play for you. And if it plays for you, then you should show it and Spe start to get input. Speaking of electronic editing, um, uh, you were actually one of the first people to use electronic editing. You actually worked on the Edit Droid, which is George Lucas's. I, I, I did it reluctantly, yes. Re yes, and I know you were one of the first people to use the Avid. We, we are blessed tonight to have uh, Larry Jordan. Uh, Larry, if you raise your hand or just stand up really quick. Uh, Larry, jo this is not the Larry Jordan you think it is. It's the Larry Jordan. It's the real it's, Larry. It's Jordan. the real Larry Jordan. Larry Jordan. If the, if there's going to be a book written about the digital revolution, uh, Larry Jordan is going to be a very big part of it. He founded two pop dot com. He was one of the uh, first people to adopt uh, uh, Final Cut Pro. He's also one of the first people to uh, edit uh, uh, feature films on the Avid uh, back in. But also. Richard Marks was one of the first people to uh, to use the Avid. Um, you I, were, only, I only used the Avid because Larry told me to. Yeah, exactly. And and they both worked on the Penny Marshall film, uh, Riding in Cars with Boys, and uh, and Larry took Richard into this whole digital realm. Although I think, from what I know, that Richard, you're not afraid of all that. You're not afraid of change. No, I, I think at the point that I switched from film uh, to digital. Uh, I sort of read the handwriting on the wall, and if I didn't make that switch, I would no longer be cutting film, as they say. Um, I had avoided using the Avid for years when it had been used on commercials and uh, music videos uh, because the storage, how much you could store and play back was a problem. Actually, one of the first films I cut uh, on an Avid, um, I would have to, if we were playing back, two and a half hours of a cut, I would have to stop the machine so the sound would catch up with the picture. Yeah. And um, uh, it was a hell of a way to watch a movie. But I think I, uh, I correctly saw that it was time to make the change. And it was very difficult. There were a lot of uh, people of my age that it, or older that it drove out of the business because they didn't want to make the change. And, uh, it's a very awkward position to be in because most of what you do as an editor, the mechanics of what you do, uh, just come so easily after years of repetition, repetition. <laughs> and and um, once you make the change, all of those what you call instincts, you have to start thinking about. And instead of concentrating on the material, you start to concentrate on the mechanics yeah. of making the cut. 
And it's a very difficult transition. But you got past that, obviously. I mean, did, are yeah, you? No, I, I, I did, indeed. And I, I mean, I enjoyed getting past it. I enjoyed the new tool. You know, James L. Brooks, we can't, we can't uh, uh, do this conversation without mentioning James L. Brooks, because uh, uh, one of the great directors, one of the great writers, I absolutely, I'm sorry, guys, I love romantic comedies. I just absolutely love romantic comedies, and yes, I'm straight. <laughs> do you like romantic comedies? Yes, I do very much. So, yeah, so do I. And, but your relationship with Jim Brooks, does, is it a, how collaborative is that? Does he, is he in the room all the time, or does he say, Richard, just give me the first cut, and let's talk about it later? No, we, he leaves me alone for the first cut unless there's... Uh, a problem with a scene that we have to look at during shooting, uh, but generally he'll stay away till I'm ready to show him the first cut, which will <clears throat> has traditionally been within two or three weeks of the finish of shooting. Um, Are you a romantic? Probably. I so am say I. that very hesitating. I mean, my wife would say no, I don't but like I am. I don't like I having that image. Do you cry easily at movies? I'm not going to tell you. Come on. <laughs> I do. I cry very easily in movies. I mean, Richard Marks has... I used to cry when there was a bad print. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of like what we were showing, there was the, the darkness of that compilation. Then I cried. I cried, too. Yeah. I'm sorry, because there's so many good, good movies there. You've had a, you've had a wonderful career. I, have. I mean, you've had a wonderful career, and you've worked with wonderful directors, and you've worked on wonderful stories. Where the hell did you get your taste? I, I, I can't answer that. I really you, can't. Can't, you can't teach that, can you? I know you and, and, your, and your beautiful wife, Barbara, have taught at UCLA editing. Can you teach taste? Can you teach picking the right performance? Can well, you, pe you, can, can you, you can, teach shaping the performance? You, yes, you can teach shaping a performance. You can teach someone to look for markers in a performance according to what that script is. You can teach that. Whether they're particularly good at it or not it has to do with the individual. Well, you, well, but but that's just it. What makes a good editor versus a great editor? Like you. I can't help. I know. It's, it's, is it indefinable? Or is, is, there, is, is there no I, I, answer to that question? I don't particularly have an answer. I, I mean, I really don't. Um, and I wouldn't dare answer. Because we can teach like the that. tool, but can we <clears throat> teach taste? You know, because well, Dee Dee Allen said right there where you're sitting. You can teach she, acting, but it doesn't mean... Yeah, but the I know person you, you teach exactly. acting to is going to be a great actor. Exactly. They could be a good actor, they could be a fair actor, they could be a terrible actor. But you can always teach a subject, and whether or not a person takes to it and is good at what you teach them really has to do with that individual, and that's an, you know, that very process is an unknown. Dee Dee Allen said right there where you're sitting, uh, she, you know, she, she's very humble, just like you. She says, no, I'm she just. She's much I'm, more humble than I am. <laughs> she was. She, she said, uh, you know, I'm, I just worked with a lot of really smart people who had really good taste. That's, that was her career. I worked with a lot of smart people who well, had really good taste. And, and how do you define taste? And, and, and you don't. You find, you find that you work well with people who either share your taste or at least respect your taste. And I think ultimately that's what a, the relationship between an editor and, yeah. and, and a director. And all these directors, these wonderful directors, these, these, these great directors continue to hire you. They hire you back. They seem to find that you do some wonderful stuff and they obviously like you. I just How, blackmail them. That's yeah, it. but it, it's important that you get along with people. <laughs> Well, because you are, an you editor know, is a psychologist and a psychiatrist, and, and you're dealing with all sorts of uh, politics and everything else. I think only 40% of the work in the cutting room is actually cutting. Really? I think, the rest, I think the rest is interpersonal relationships and being able to get along with people, get along with the directors, 
uh, get along with anyone involved in the production. Uh, it is, you know, in being a collaborative piece of work, making a film forces you to entertain the idea that you have to be able to collaborate with other people.